Hello, everyone. We're so excited and happy that you're here today. Um, and I am so honored to introduce you to one of our amazing speakers for today, Dr. Emily Dorowski. Dr. Dorowski has earned four degrees, a bachelor's in psychology from Idaho State University, a master's and doctorate in cognitive psychology from Michigan State University, and a master's in library and information science from San Jose State University. She has taught courses both here at BYU Provo and at BYU-Idaho in the psychology department. She was a co-lead on a study that looked at the different perceptions and attitudes between men and women in the workforce. She held several workshops to discuss the results of this study with library employees, leading to conversation and collaboration on what policies could be put into place to mitigate these differences. Over the years, Dr. Drowsey's research focus and interest have turned increasingly more towards gender equity and increasing women's influence, which led her to earn a position with the UWLP, which is the Utah Women in Leadership Project. In her role as an associate director, Dr. Dorowski helped women to reach their personal, professional, and educational goals by striving to influence policy, break down gender barriers, and shift sometimes limiting or exclusionary mindsets. She held this position for a year and is now currently working full-time in her home raising her children. Um, I am honored to introduce our other speaker for today, Dr. Helen Nags, and together they will be presenting on perceptions of gender bias in Utah workplaces. Um, Dr. Nags is originally from England and has lived in Utah for the past 17 years. She completed her MBA with English universities and has a background in skin biology. Dr. Nags um, transitioned her career to Utah to accept a role um, at New Skin as the vice president, where she now leads the research and development efforts for personal care as well as their nutritionals. Um, Dr. Nags has a commitment to fostering inclusive and supportive workplaces. She was not only invited to lead the Women's Rising Employee Resource Group, but also chairs this initiative that helps support specific minorities. It was through her involvement in this group that Dr. Nags de developed a keen interest in the topic they will be addressing today. She began to research unconscious bias in the workplace, which led her to collaborate with Dr. Dorowski. Together, they bring different perspectives that have enriched their research. Um, Dr. Nags has an interest in investigating both men and women's unconscious biases in the Utah workforce. Dr. Nags and Dr. Dorowski are not only here to share their research findings, but also highlight the resources available to address gender bias through the Utah Women Leadership Project. They stand as testaments to the power of creating inclusive workplaces and unraveling unconscious biases in the workplace. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Helen Nags and Dr. Emily Dorowski. Hello, everyone. Can, can you all hear me okay? I have the mic is on, yeah? Good? We're in the back? Good? Great. All right, so I am truly honored to be here today. Um, I, I'm going to start off the presentation, and then I'm going to invite um, Dr. Dorowski to come up and tell you a little bit about some of the um, significance of this work and also the Utah Women's Leadership Project. So actually, we might go back to the first. Can we go back to the title <coughs> slide? Maybe? OK, brilliant. So I also want you guys to think about this, right? And think about the information that I'm telling you. Do you understand what unconscious bias is? Yes? No? OK, very good. Right? So to me, um, a bias is something that we do where we preferentially treat someone over another person. right? And when we say it's unconscious, it means that we don't know we're doing it. So you know, it's something that maybe we've had from our upbringing, or maybe um, we've had instilled from a, um, in us from our parents, or whatever. It's a way of us interacting with others in an unconscious way, which may treat, which may provide preferential treatment to one person over another. And that could be gendered, right? It could be men versus women. We treat women in a different way to men, or it could be um, with different um, people from different backgrounds, like different ethnic, ethnic backgrounds. Okay, so this work today is about unconscious bias between genders, men and women, and the specific questions that I asked in this research 
were, were two, right? We're just focused on Utah. That was something that was unique about this study. But I wanted to understand what are women's experiences and perceptions of gender bias in the Utah workplace? So we're looking at the Utah workplace, businesses in Utah, right, where I work, where others work, where you may work one day, right? And I'm, and I'm asking women, what are your experiences here? And what are your perceptions about those experiences? And, and so that, that was one aspect. I was, I was interested in, in women. And then I thought, OK, so, so we've also got the guys, right, men. But I want to know, what is, what is men's perception of women's experiences, right? What are the men seeing? And, and what is the, their perception of, of how women are interacting and also behaving in the workplace? What are their experiences? So those are the two questions. What are women's experiences? And how do men perceive those women's experiences, OK? So the next thing I needed in doing this research was a tool. Right? We need a way of gathering data. How are we going to do that? We need a tool. And um, Susan Madsen, Dr. Susan Madsen, was, was really helpful and supportive, and, and Greg Madsen, her husband, as well. Um, they had been doing some work, and they directed me to look at a tool. And, and these references we can make available from Amy Deal, who's in Pennsylvania. So she's, she's a researcher that has developed a tool, and it's called a gender bias scale. Right? And she's uh, published several papers on how she developed the tool, how she interrogated the tool to make sure that it was really robust. And then she did some work with the tool as well to look at uh, women's perceptions. And then what um, Greg Madsen had done was adapt that tool for men. So he took Amy's, um, Amy's um, questions, her, her questionnaire, if you, if you like, and he converted it so that you could use the same questionnaire for men. And the questionnaire itself consists of these 47 <coughs> statements. right? So for men, the research was done in a global male population. Right? So I'm just looking in Utah, and I'm looking at men and women specifically working in the same workplaces in Utah. And the tool contains statements. It's 47 statements about um, aspects of the workplace that women or men might come across in the workplace environment. So women might have come across a situation where they feel that they have to work harder than my male colleagues for the same credibility, right? So we're asking the women to rate that on a scale. And I'll talk about the scale in a minute. Another example is we're asking women, do I feel welcome while attending social events with my male colleagues? So that's another example. It's 47 of these statements. And then for men, we flipped that a little bit. And we said to the men, so the, the questionnaire for men, the statements um, read, in my workplace, women work harder than their male colleagues for the same credibility. Rate it on a scale. In my workplace, women feel welcome while attending social <coughs> events with their male colleagues. Rate it on a scale, OK? So we're asking women about their experiences. And we're asking men about their perceptions of women's experiences. OK, that's, that's quite key to understanding. So here's the scale. This is a Likert scale. Um, you've probably come across this. Um, so it goes from strongly disagree, somewhat disagree, neither disagree or disagree, somewhat agree, strongly agree. OK, so that's what we're doing. And in Amy's work, when she was developing her tool, because she had 47 statements, she needed some way of distilling the data down and understanding sort of the key aspects of the information she was getting. So she grouped those 47 statements into different areas of um, what she called higher order factors. So she called 
One group, male privilege. Another group of situations, disproportionate constraint, insufficient support, devaluation, hostility, and acquiescence. And I think I put, OK, so this is the original table from Amy's work where she um, defines each of those higher order factors and the subcategories that make those up. And I have, I, I, I didn't bring enough handouts for everybody, I'm sorry, but I've got 20 of, um, of these, 20 of this particular slide, if you guys are interested and want more information. So I'm happy to give those to you. So male privilege, for example, um, that would be women placed in really high risk roles. Um, male culture might be a male-dominated male organizational <coughs> norm. Insufficient support might be just lack of mentoring, the lack of female role models in the workforce, right? So all different types of categories here. So let's talk about, and I'm, you guys can, I'll give you the, um, the handout if you want, so I'm, I'm wanting to make sure that we keep on time as well. Um, this is the characteristics of the survey participants. And one criticism of this work could be that it was a small, a small group, a small sample size, right? There's, there's thousands and thousands of people in the Utah workforce. Um, this sample included 119 participants. 72.2% um, were women, 27.8 were men. So it was, it was focused more on women than men. The, the, um, when I was um, sending out and distributing the questionnaire, I went mainly through um, women's organizations and LinkedIn networks and my social media contacts, right? So, so obviously, it's more polarized to the women than the men from the data set, OK? Um, and I said that the higher percentage of women respondents is likely a result of the survey being communicated predominantly through women, women's groups. But we did. We did address that when we did the statistical analysis. So we did um, some accounting for this uh, smaller, the inherent equality of the sample size when we did the stats. A few more characteristics of the SAVE participants. Most respondents were white, um, and they had lived in Utah for five years more than five years, five years or more, and were parents with 57.9% having daughters. And the majority were managers in their organizations. Um, they worked for international organizations based here in Utah that had about in the 500 to 10,000 employee range. Okay, and then 68% of those had never worked outside Utah. So that was the level of um, different diversity that we had in the, um, in the responses. Okay. Let's see if we can get to the next slide. There we go. You guys are still are following me along, right? We're, we're all good. OK. There we go. So with that being the case, let's have a look at some of the data. Oh, yeah, it's me. <laughs> it's still, oh, there we go. OK. So here is the first set of data. So let me explain how this is set up, right? So the Likert scale is along the y-axis, OK? So 1, if you remember, was strongly disagree. And it spans all the way to 5, which was strongly agree. And then 3 was neither agree nor disagree. And this data shows um, the responses of Utah women to the different statements that grouped together um, uh, talked about things like the male culture, glass cliff, two-person career, unequal standards, right? Lack of mentorship, we talked about that. So here we see that most of the results are between three to four. So what does this tell us? And let's think about if the results are above three, 
What's that telling us? It's telling us that women are predominantly agreeing with these statements. Okay? So now, and this is a Utah population. So one of the questions that I wanted to ask, because it was a small sample size, was how does this compare to previous work that Amy had done, where she had used this same tool, and she'd looked at women's populations outside of Utah. Were there any similarities? And do you want to move it? OK. And it's down. Down or that one. Perfect. So Amy's work is in women's leaders. And can you see how closely the two lines map? So what does this tell us about the data? Do you think, yeah, it's not just a Utah problem, right? It's not just a phenomenon in Utah. This is actually quite typical. And it was funny finding this, because I, I myself have worked both in Utah and also outside of Utah. I've worked in the UK, I've worked in Asia, in huge organizations. And I actually think it doesn't, it doesn't differ from my own experience. Right? I find the situations are very similar. OK, so um, women are saying, for example, that they have a lack of mentoring in the workforce. They have a lack of sponsorship in the workforce. They're agreeing that they don't feel that their pay is equal to men. Right? So those were the types of questions that we're asking. They're somewhat agreeing, somewhat disagreeing with this um, characteristic called Queen Bee Syndrome, which is where they're not treated well with other women. Now, I want to now to show the data for the male population. Where do you think that's going to be before I, before I graph that? It might be. <laughs> OK, let's take a look. So someone here said lower. Right, so let's see. Ah. OK, so you were right, right? So, so the men are more disagreeing with the statements. OK, so, so I'm not saying anything in terms of right or wrong. This is the perception. This is their perception. What's really important here is that this gap in perception could inhibit communication and awareness right, in how we interact in the workplace and how we overcome situations and solutions in the workplace. right? So that's why this information is so important, because it tells us that women are, are, are perceiving one thing, but men perceive a different thing of, of where women are in the workplace. And unless we close that gap, then I think we've always got this sort of bridge to cross and bear in mind as we navigate the workplace situation. OK. So now I ask the question, because, because Dr. Madsen had looked at uh, a, men, a male population global, global guys, right? So I said, OK, so is, is this a Utah? Is this typical of Utah? Is it specific to Utah? Or is it? Is, is it similar to a global population of men? So what do you think about that? What do you think? Now, what? about the same, right? So I said this was a very small sample size at the beginning. Um, the global male population was, a, was several thousands of men. Um, and I think when I look at this data, because I had a question, do I want to continue getting data and collect a larger sample size? Or do I want to start to think about what could I do with this data, right? You, you, in research, you come across these, do I continue to really um, make sure that my work is reproducible? Or do I look to see if I can do something with it? And because the findings, I felt that the findings were so consistent with what other people were seeing in, in larger populations, I didn't go on and increase my population, my sample size, right? So that was my thinking there. So um, really sort of interesting um, sort of um, 
information about how men and women view their workplace experience. And the other thing that I want to sort of get across to you is it's, this is important to keep in mind because in today's workplace, and I can attest to this, you know, there's, there's um, you know, big, big problems that we face, right? There's challenges, a lot of challenges, right, in, in businesses. Okay, because we went through, for example, COVID, and we had all sorts of challenges through that in terms of how a business functions. How does a business function with the supply chain? How does a business function in finding customers when everybody's stuck in their house, right? And now we're in a different set of situations following COVID when we're trying to operate a business, generate revenue, there's a lot of inflation, you know, you guys, I'm sure, are living this. So in order to solve those problems, in order to find the best solutions, the optimal solutions for the business, what do we need in the workplace? We need lots of thinking, lots of people that have different backgrounds, that can think through problems in different ways, and that can approach problems and find solutions in different ways. And, and that's why we really need to have these diverse groups in the workforce in order to bring the best thinking and the best minds to bear on business problems today. And you know what we're seeing here is that unconsciously in the workplace, we have, we're giving sort of preferential treatment to, to men versus women. So it's something that we need to be really aware about as we try to resolve you know, the typical business problems that we're approaching today um, in the best possible way. OK, so takeaways from this. Uh, I took um, scientifically validated published tools from the literature um, and I applied those to measure perceptions of gender bias in men and in women in Utah. So this was a unique piece of work because nobody had taken those tools before to look at um, men versus women in one, in one um, state or in the same group. Um, we demonstrated that there are gender differences in bias perception, and importantly, these appear to be universal perceptions. So I'm going to invite um, Dr. Emily Dorowski to, um, I'm going to hand it over to you, Emily. Thank you. Excited to be here today, and I want to start first off talking about what might the impacts of this data mean for workplaces. And then what are some opportunities we have to address the, these differences and perceptions of bias? And then I want to talk about efforts in Utah that are striving to make Utah a better place for women and girls. So the impacts. When we feel like we have constrained communication, when our pay is not equal, that's going to impact our job satisfaction. And research shows that job satisfaction impacts how long we're willing to stay in a position. Um, and when these unconscious biases are present, that can um, make it harder to overcome problems like the pay gap. It also can impact professional development when there's these unconscious biases. So for example, an unconscious bi bias might be like, if there's a woman in the workplace who has children, well, you know, maybe we won't ask them if they want to travel to a conference because we'll just automatically assume they probably don't want to travel. You know, they need to make sure they can be there for their kids. But we need to, like, you know, not make those assumptions, but, you know, ask the women to make those decisions for themselves. And then we just, the, the better we can make our workplace culture and overcome these biases, the more likely it's going to um, translate to things like better problem solving, more diverse thinking in the workplace that lead to better solutions. So some opportunities we hope that have, will come out of this research, and I'll, I'll say how we made the connection is that I, at the time I was the associate director for the Utah Women in Leadership Project, and we publish reports um, typically every month, and we like to get our reports out in front of not only the general public, but policymakers and community leaders, and so we had this privilege of um, taking Dr. Nag's research and putting it out in this way through the UWP publication system. And what we hope is coming out of this is starting conversations, influencing employee resource groups, like 
creating groups for women in workplaces where they can talk about maybe some barriers that they're facing and bring men as allies into those conversations to talk about how to break down the barriers or the obstacles. There's opportunities for HR training. Usually we need more than just the one-off Here's what unconscious bias is. Please don't do it. Like It needs to be a little bit deeper than that. But we can also have workplaces analyze their, their wages across genders and you know, maybe bring an outside consulting company in to do that analysis for them and, and then have a plan to eradicate those pay gaps across time. And there's also opportunity to think about what policies that workplaces have and ha whether they're family friendly. And because in the end, things that are family friendly are going to benefit both men and women. So there's a lot of the things that we can implement are, are going to increase job satisfaction for everyone. All right, so let me turn to talking about the UWLP or the Utah Women in Leadership Project. Our mission is to strengthen the impact of Utah girls and women. We do this by publishing research, which I already mentioned. We do um, the kind of reports like Dr. Nags, which are called research briefs, that's original research. We also do research snapshots, which are even shorter and take on a topic and look at all the existing data out there and synthesize it into a report. We create resources from these. So for example, we have a huge set of dashboards that show things like what is the pay gap in Utah across time, what is the political, you know, the percentage of women that are politically representing Utah across time? So you can see all these different dashboards. So we can see like what are what are the trends in Utah and how are we doing? And then we also convene trainings and events that are meant to inspire growth and change. So I just wanted to give you a couple examples beyond what this report that we're talking about, the kind of research that we've published in the last year as I was associate director. Um, one of them was about child care. Child care is a huge struggle, not just in Utah, but in many places. There was a lot of COVID funding that came about for child care, and that's, we're kind of hitting a funding cliff. And um, there are a lot of places in Utah that we would call a child care desert, where there's more children than there are slots available for children. It, and when we're looking at how, what percentage of the parents are in the workforce. Uh, we also did one on mammography. So this is, you know, for women over 40, how many have gotten a mammogram in the past two years? And we, our percentage is lower than the nation. And that's a lot of times what we do. We'll say, what, co what does the data say about Utah, but then how is it looking compared to the rest of the nation? And unfortunately, in a lot of different areas, even something, you know, fairly simple as a mam getting mammogram, we're, we're lagging behind the nation and the percentage of women who are doing that. And then an, a couple examples of some other briefs. One was 100 companies championing women. So this was a collaboration between the UWLP and GOIO, which is the government's Office of Economic Opportunity. And we had individual com or organizations and companies submit an application to be considered for, to be nominated as a company that's championing women. And they had to kind of say, what policies do you have in place that's um, can benefit women or that are family friendly, and then we put out they would um, they would get recognized for those. And then at the end of that first campaign, there's a second campaign going on. We actually took the data from their applications and summarized it into a paper, so other Utah companies could see what's going on, what other companies are doing, and some of the like top things like companies um, tout having flexible hours, remote work options, and so forth. Um, child care support was a lot lower, for example, so that's something where we can work on that. And then I just wanted to mention this one, and all of these reports are on our website, utwomen.org. This one was so fascinating. This is research done um, by a professor at the U, and it's about the importance of social belonging. So she looks at, for women, compared to men, but also um, other minority status like race or um, sexual orientation, how the impact of like kind of overt discrimination versus the feelings of social belonging impact well-being. So uh, for a long time, people would predict, well, if, if you're experiencing overt discrimination, of course, that's going to affect well-being. But what she found is that that feeling of belonging 
not, not just people aren't mean to me, but people like accept me and, and make me feel like they're going to care for me, that can predict well-being above and beyond the overt discrimination. So fascinating stuff. Okay, so in the last year and a half, well, pretty much the last year, it started kind of around October and November, and we launched in June, but we started a new initiative called Boulder Way Forward for Utah. You can see more information at abolderwayforward.org. But this is um, where the UWLP is acting as um, kind of a, a hosting organization, but we're trying to bring in individuals across the whole state to enact change for women and girls. Because at our current trajectory on a lot of these different areas, we're just, it's going to take decades to see real change. And the, the goal here is by 2030 to see some significant change across areas such as education, particularly like how many women are getting graduate degrees. Women are, compared to men, are doing actually slightly better with bachelor's degrees, but not with grad degrees. Um, community engagement, this is political representation, for example, advocacy, being on boards and commissions, all the way to safety and security, like decreasing domestic violence, um, improving the workplace for women, that's what we're talking about, and decreasing unconscious bias, and then health and well-being. This would be like maternal mental health, um, the mammogram stuff. We, so in this initiative, we have gathered and um, brought in leaders that are already doing work in each of these, um, and it, these are five categories, but we actually have 18 different areas that we're looking at. And these leaders are coming together to form working groups, and we're also going down into the counties to try and find leaders that can come together and think about how do these areas impact the women and girls in this county, and what initiatives do we need to initiate. And that, we will close off there so we can have time for the response and questions. Our emails are up here. We would love to chat with you if you have more questions. Thank you. Dr. Nags and Dr. Dorowski's research identifies a stark contrast between women's experiences and their perceptions of gender bias in the Utah workplace and men's perception of women's experience of gender bias in, Utah, in, the work, in the Utah workplace. In a world where women's voices and experiences often go unheard and overlooked, their research gives support and credibility to Utah women's workplaces' experiences and identifies specific areas where gender bias is present and needs to be addressed. Although their research focuses on the perception of Utah women and men, Dr. Nags and Dr. Drowski believe this issue is much larger than Utah and actually spans across the nation. As their findings reach more individuals, organizations, and companies, their research is sure to have far-reaching utility in not only global women's studies, but every field that employs or educates women. It is their hope this research will inspire improvements in the gender pay gap, professional development, and workplace culture across not only Utah, but the country. Coupling the learnings presented by Dr. Nags and Dr. Dorowski with our mindset regarding all professional endeavors is essential in moving forward with careers, continuing discussions regarding gender pay gaps, and beginning any research involving a solution to these gender biases. One per perpetuation of these gender biases could be the disparity between women workers and the gender of people in leadership positions. Utah's Department of Workforce Services reports that almost half about 44% of the workforce is made up of, by women. However, according to the 2000 18 findings of the Utah Women in Leadership Project, under 5% of corporate CEOs, and about a third of board seats are held by women. The UWLP's research can offer insights on how to bridge this gap, bringing more women into leadership positions, which will inevitably bring powerful change for all women in the workforce. In light of this research, we must remember to do our part, use our voices, and seek opportunities to implement any and all changes we, that will uplift and support Utah women workers, particularly in the ways suggested by Dr. Nags and Dr. Dorowski. Thank you. Um, so we're going to alternate with questions in person and on Zoom. So um, just anyone in the room, if you want to ask an in-person question, just come and get in line here. Well, I'll start us out. Um, I think it's really inspiring hearing about the UWLP's like mission and goals. But do you have like suggestions or um, recommendations of ways that us as interested students or just like women in general in Utah 
might be able to get more involved with the UWLP and assist in furthering its mission? Yeah, that is a really good question. So if you go to the a boulderwayforward.org, there is a tab where you can say, like, I want to get involved, and there's a little survey, and you can say, of those 18 areas that we're trying to influence, which ones you're most interested in, and then they will we'll kind of plug you into those, um, the leadership over those areas. So we would love, love, love yeah. more college students to engage. Definitely. And this, there's, um, they're, they're called spokes. The 18 um, areas are called spokes. The spokes, I think it's the higher education spoke, which we would, I think we'd love more education because as, as in the response you said, use our voice, right? And so that would be a great opportunity to do that. But there's, I mean, there's also a leadership development. Yeah. We call it spoke because it's kind of this analogy of wheel of change. Um, and, but there is a leadership development and there's a working group that's for higher ed under that spoke. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of options. Hi, so the first question on Zoom comes from Lexi Cornish. Um, Lexi says, Dr. Nags, uh, you mentioned how women in Utah report a lack of mentoring and, spo and sponsorship in the workplace. How might we create better structural support and mentoring in the workplace without further placing men in positions of power over women? Yeah, I, I think, um, and again, I, I, I'll refer back to the response because there were some statistics there. Um, given about we have women entering the workforce, right? But as they, as you get, as your career gets grows, it gets longer. Women are opting out of the workforce, and that's the aspect that needs to get really addressed through through whatever. I mean, Emily talked about um, you know ha having more flexible um, working options that really speak to. Um, women's, a lot of women's needs and also childcare availability. So creating an environment that retains women in the workforce so they can continue to develop as leaders in those, um, in those workplaces, I think can help get more women into places of influence. Because that's, that's what's lacking at the moment. It's ha having that seat at the table so that when important discussions are happening, there's a, there's a women voice, right? Um, and it's the same also for all types of minorities, right? We need to have, we need to be encouraging um, people from different backgrounds to, um, you know, into the workforce, retaining them so that they can grow their careers and then come into positions of influence and have a seat at the table during these discussions. Um, Dr. Nag, so you talk about how like Utah it like aligns with like the globe, right? Like um, with their the women's perceptions and also the men's. Um, but do you think if you if in your opinion if you were doing qualitative work over quantitative that we would still see that? Like we may have the same general reactions like um, responses, but I think Utah we also has a very unique culture. So if we went into like the details of their how they experienced that bias, do we think it would still align with the rest of the world? Mm, I I don't know. I guess so that that's a great question, right? And I'm sure it's it's you know quite complex if you took it apart. Um, I would say so. Let me talk to my own experience a little bit. Um, so I started in the in England, right? Um, and in the UK as a university student in biology. I was, I was in a minority as a woman, and this is 30 years ago. Um, and so I recently did an MBA, and I took it, I went to business classes, I did it in the UK again. And I was amazed that I was still the minority woman. There was 100 men and five women in an MBA class. I just, I, it was uh, amazing to me. So, so I, I would say that qualitatively, the, you know, you'd still get, you'd still see similar results, but I'd love to hear Emily's thoughts on that oh. too. I mean, I would say, so in my intro, they talked about how he's involved with a study when I was at the BYU library, and we looked at um, perceptions of men and women about everything from like the hiring process to onboarding to professional development, and we certainly saw you know, gender differences, not like on every single thing, but many of the things. And, and we did have some qualitative data where people could write in responses. And we certainly saw comments mm -hmm. about cultural elements, church elements, and how that 
you know, we're at a church university and, and how all of that may be impacting some of the things like authority in the workplace, for example. <laughs> Good question. Yeah. Hi, the next question on Zoom comes from Avery Stonely. Avery asks, why do you think that men rate women as facing more discrimination in categories of constrained career and self-effacing than women report that they experience? Sorry, can you? Yeah, yeah. So why do you think that men rate women as facing more oh. discrimination in the categories of constrained career and self-effacing than women report that they experience? I, I have an idea. Okay. Comment. So one idea, now our data is not necessarily saying this, but one idea might be um, that men may think there are certain cases where women have more control, right? Women have control, so to speak, over choosing whether they speak up, and they have control over choosing what career they, you know, they, they pursue. And so in, they might, in some ways, like be placing more responsibility on women. Um, you'll see like in cases where like the male privilege or category what the men were rating that much lower. And that's kind of m perhaps more on the culture and the, the maleness that's creating that. So they're kind of like, uh, maybe women need m have more responsibility in what's happening, but not when it comes to maybe where they might have more responsibility, like, no, no, we're, it's fine there. You know, they're, they're seeing less perception of bias there. I think the, the other thing that I would say to that is, you know, it, uh, in meetings that I'm in, that I've seen, you know, in actual examples in the workplace, women sometimes tend to hesitate when they speak up, and the, you know, the guys get in there straight away, right? And 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 I think we need to. So so I am mindful of that, and I always provide opportunities for women to speak. So so there's two learnings there as as a woman in a workplace. The first one is if you are a woman leader in the workplace, provi provide an environment where everyone is heard. That is so important. And it's so easy to overlook when you're trying to accomplish an agenda in a meeting, but just make sure everybody's heard. The other thing is I would you know, really encourage you know, all of you here to, to, to speak up, you know, have that confidence that we do want to hear your voices. And it's, it's really important that you feel that because it, it will be valued and appreciated. Thank you so much. We're out of time, but we really appreciate both of you coming here and speaking to us and answering our questions. And if we can give Dr. Nags and Dr. Dorowski one more round Thank of applause. You. Thank you.